We're good? All right. Uh, I will call the uh, Tuesday, January 24th, regular council meeting to order. And uh, with that, I will do the land acknowledgement that the City of Fort Saskatchewan is located within Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Nihawak, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto Sioux, Salto Nakota Sioux, and Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. It is because of our treaty relationship that we can live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory. Thank you. So we will begin uh, with a, uh, we do have three items that we can do as part of a consent agenda, if council is willing. So if somebody would like to put the motion on for the consent agenda. Have it in front of you. And that would include item 3, 7.3, and 7.4. Councillor Blizzard? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the items. Do I have to read them all out that are on the consent yep. agenda? Yep. Okay, item 3, approval of the minutes of the uh, January 10th, 2023 regular council meeting, 7.3 rescinding council documents that council rescind docu council code of conduct procedure GOV-010-C and liability property and mobile equipment insurance community groups policy SAF-005-C and 7.4 cancellation of the May 23rd, 2023 regular council meeting. Okay, do you all right, thank you. And with consent agenda uh, items, if anybody does choose to have one not uh, included in, in this during debate, you can request for one to be severed from this. Uh, so I will just ask if there's any debate on this. Not seeing or hearing any. I will close the motion. Please cast your vote. That is carried 7 nothing. Uh, thank you. Okay, we have, uh, let's see, no delegations who have registered. So we will deal with the review of animal control bylaw restricted dog order uh, for compliance. So with this, the process will be that uh, Corrine Rayner will come forward to make a presentation. Following that, um, Council may ask questions. Following that, I will request the uh, individuals who have appealed the decision will be able to come to the table and speak for up to a maximum of 10 minutes and ask, answer questions. And then we can ask clarifying questions. And then at the end of that, um, Ms. Rayner would return to the table for any final questions. So that is the process when something uh, is being uh, appealed, a decision of... Uh, by law enforcement. All right, Ms. Rayner, go ahead. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Kareen Rayner and I am the Director of Protective Services for the City. With me, I have Community Peace Officer Ben Sharp to help me ask, answer any of the questions that you may have. We are here to speak to the restricted dog licensing order issued to Mr. Sarah Mullen on November 25th, 2022. I will provide Council with information on the Animal Control Bylaw and the sections that pertain to restricted dogs in Fort Saskatchewan, the circumstances that led up to us coming in contact with the Mullins dog, Winston, and having the restricted dog order served to them, and then at our administration's recommendations. Council will have an opportunity to hear from the Mullins uh, regarding their dog, Winston, and after this, Council will have options to consider um, of how we will proceed. The Animal Control Bylaw C7-16 defines restricted dogs as the following. A restricted dog is that one that has chased, attacked, or bitten any person or animal causing physical injury and resulted in a conviction under the bylaw. A dog that has chased, attacked, bitten any person or animal on more than one occasion with or without causing physical injury, which resulted in separate convictions under this bylaw. 
it can also be a dog that has been made the subject of an order under the Dangerous Do Dogs Act. The Animal Control Bylaw sets out the conditions placed on a restricted dog. And so these conditions have been within the order that was issued to the Mullins. A restricted dog license is $208 or $108 for the seniors rate. Insurance must be purchased with a $2 million liability coverage for that animal. When the dog is off premises, it must be muzzled, held on a leash and under the control of someone over the age of 18. When on the premises, the conditions are that the dog must be under the control of someone over the age of 18. Signs must be posted on the premises alerting people that there is a restricted dog on the premises. The dog shall be secured in a fully enclosed pen when outdoors and the dog must be chained and muzzled while outdoors. We first became aware of Winston on December 22nd of 2021. Officer Sharp responded to a complaint of a dog bite. Winston bit the neighbor and a ticket was issued for section 4.8A of the Animal Control Bylaw, where an owner of a dog um, shall not permit a dog to bite um, or threaten a person. And so that ticket was paid by the Mullins resulting in a conviction under that offense. Then there was a second offense on November 12th of 2022 where Winston charged at a complainant. Winston pulled Mr. Mullen to the ground trying to get the complainant who was across the street. The complainant reported to municipal enforcement that she had been charged by Winston on many occasion, occasions and she was fearful for her life in this instance. Mr. Mullen did manage to keep Winston from running away in this instance, however the complainant reported being very fearful. A ticket was issued by Officer Carnegie to Mr. Mullen for this instance. However, the ticket had been withdrawn because the complainant and the Mullins are neighbors and they worked out a walking schedule and they come to an agreement of, of how that would work. But that second instant um, incident caused Officer Sharp to go ahead and issue a restricted dog order because it was the second offense. Um, that order was issued on November 25th of 2022, and the Mullins had 14 days to request a review of counsel for that order. Due to the severity and more than one offense that Winston was involved in, either biting or lunging at another resident, officers have had reasonable grounds to issue the restricted dog order under the Animal Control Bylaw. Administration is recommending that council confirm the restricted dog order for the Mullins dog Winston and give a new compliance date of February 15th, 2023. With, within the bylaw, a person who receives an order can submit a request to council to review that order. After that review, council may confirm, vary, substitute or cancel, or cancel that order. So we can make substitutions within the order that was given to council or given to the Mullins if that's council's wishes. Um, that's all I have for you. I can answer any questions now or we can let the Mullins come up and then I'll answer questions. I'll no, do. we'll uh, we'll do questions of council now. Okay. And then that way they also get to hear what the questions are before sure. they come up. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're first. Thank you, Mayor Thatcher. Green, I'm looking for confirmation of my understanding of the um, control bylaw. This dog, there was a, a, a ticket issued or, or a, a, and something issued under Section 8 of the bylaw. Um, section 8 doesn't allow counsel to, doesn't allow for appeal to counsel and does not allow counsel to weigh in on, on the subject. Um, so assuming I'm right, why are we here? And if I'm wrong, please point that out to me, please. Your Worship, through to Councillor Kelly, there is a section um, within the bylaw that that offers the Mullins the, the opportunity to appeal or have council review the order that was issued. What section is that, please? That is 13.3. Give me a second. I'd like to review that. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. I missed that. Appreciate it. Yep. <laughs> you're good. Okay. Uh, Councilor Macon, you're next. Uh, thank you, Kareen. Um, the, so, so I understand this was two different complainants in these two cases where tickets were issued. Your Worship, through to Councillor Macon. So it was two, two instances with the same dog, but the complainants were the neighbors. The same neighbor. The same neighbors, yes. Okay. And is there the possibility of providing more context around the... I heard a little bit more about the second incident, but is there any more context to the first one? Like, were they in the front of... Or were they on the street? Were they in their yard? Like, where, when, how did the dog bite? I'll let Officer um, Sharp answer that question. Your Worship, so on the first incident, the neighbor was in their own front yard. I believe they were doing some sweeping, and the dog came from the Mullins property, ran to the neighbor's property onto theirs, and then consequently bit uh, the gentleman who was out in their own front yard. Um, can I ask a clarifying on that? Um, the dog came from its own yard or out of the house? Just out of curiosity. Your Worship, it came, it was, I believe the, the gate was open and it came from their yard okay. onto the neighbor's yard, not from inside the home, from what I understand. Okay, that's all for me for now. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, you. Councillor Abatoye, go ahead. Thank you, Karin, for your presentation. Um, so I've been on council for the last five years, and this is the first time I'm, I'm seeing something like this. So my question is that with so many dogs in our community, is this an unusual um, situation? Um, do we, how many of these types of complaints have we had in the past, and why is this one peculiar? Your Worship, through to Councillor Abatoya. So just for 2022, we have four instances um, where a, someone was bitten by a dog and so they were deemed to be a restricted animal. Um, it is a rare occurrence and we don't have a lot of restricted dogs in the city of Fort Saskatchewan. This is the first appeal or review that I've been involved in as well. Okay, so first time the, um, the complainant has, um, has appealed, that's why it's coming to council. Councillor Blizzard. So you said it was the same neighbor's house, but I thought I read in there that it was a he the first time with a bite, and then it sounded like a she walking. So is this the same couple in the same house that were? Through your worship to Councillor Blizzard, that's correct. Okay, so it was two different people that were involved. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it for now. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Harris. So once um, an action of this type is undertaken and the dog is then considered to be um, a restricted animal, is there any sort of a parole period or a period, just correct me if I'm wrong, where is that ad infinitum? In other words, going forward, this dog is then considered to be a bad dog. Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris, that's correct. So currently within the bylaw, there isn't a uh, time for us to go back and review these restricted dog licenses once they are deemed that um, restricted dog that continues on. So if council felt that um, this dog deserved this um, uh, punitive sanction, uh, could council then put a time specific? In other words, it is then in doggy prison for a year? When I say that, and I'm not trying to make light of this, obviously, but ultimately this is a form of prison, if you will. And under our penal system in Canada, there's a right of a, you know, parole and, a, you know, all that sort of stuff. So what's, what's the situation with animal control in that regard? Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris, it is, it is up, to the, up to Council that you can vary or substitute okay. any of the conditions within the order. And we can make those changes and reserve that order. Um, it, the animal control bylaw is up for review this year, so I, I understand what you're saying about we do need, I feel, uh, some type of a review process going forward in there, but it's not currently in there. Yeah, you know, ultimately, I'm not a dog person, but, uh, you know, I understand enough about animal uh, behavior to understand that do okay. dogs are good to people they know, but this in the case is a different yeah. situation, right? That's the question. 
In other words, we felt that there was a problem that had to lay two charges. Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris, yes. According to the bylaw, there was reasonable grounds to to make the Mullins dog to be a restricted dog. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple qu quick questions. So, in the first instance, the so there the an our dog was not provoked. The animal just came out and came out and bit the person for no apparent reason. Your worship, through to count or your, through to your worship. <laughs> That's correct. That's according to the statements that we have from the complainants and the individual that was bitten, and also Officer Sharp did that investigation. Okay, and then in the second instant, the person was across the street. The dog came out and was barking and and threatening, and and Mr. Mullen was able to subdue the dog, or like. You kind of talked about that, but so based on what the complaint was? That's correct. So, Your Worship, um, the complainant contacted municipal enforcement because she on multiple occasions has been lunged at by Winston. And in this particular instance, um, she was walking down the street. Mr. Mullen and Winston were coming, I believe ac they were across the street, and Winston tried to get away on Mr. Mullen, pulling him to the ground, and he was lunging towards the complainant. So that is why a ticket was issued. It was then withdrawn because they had worked out a better walking schedule, and she, the complainant felt that they had worked out um, the situation. Okay, so my next off uh, is... is for our peace officer. So in attending this, because um, we don't know what the dog looks like, the weight, weight or anything, um, even though these two neighbors have worked it out, I'm just going to ask, in your opinion, um, you know, is this dog a threat to other people who haven't worked out a walking schedule? Your Worship, in my opinion, it would be a threat. Um, that's why the ticket was issued for that. That's why the the order was issued for it to become a restricted dog. Uh, in my opinion of that, if a dog has bitten, it's capable of biting again. Um, and I would hate to see that happen again, which is why the order and the ticket were issued. Okay, thank you. All right, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question would be for, for Officer Sharp. Uh, you, you visited the property. What type of enclosure of fencing and, and signage currently exists at this property? Your Worship, through you, Councillor Noyan. When I was there dealing with the, the file, um, the only thing in place was just a fenced-in yard. Um, I believe the height was approximately shoulder height for that fence. Um, at that time, that's all that was present. Okay, so currently the, the height of the fence also wouldn't, wouldn't allow for the dog to es escape should it, the gates be closed? I, I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. Um, okay. I'm not sure the capability of the dog getting over that fence or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So that appears to be all the questions of the two of you. I'll have you uh, just take a seat to the back. And at this point in time, I would invite Cyril and Lori Mullen to come forward to the presentation table. And I'll have you uh, bring this down and you can push the button on it so so you can speak and you'll have up to a maximum of 10 minutes. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, the first occasion, I don't know whether you received all the letters, but um, my stepdaughter was up for Christmas. They were leaving that day. And the incident where Winston bit our neighbor, he had held... They said a broom, but she said a shovel. I, I don't know whether it was a defensive move or whether it was an aggression move on his part. I have no idea. Winston, we haven't had a problem with anybody else except those two. And they've always said they love dogs. They've never had a problem. I, we don't know why he doesn't like them. But it's just those two. And... When my husband fell, he didn't fall because the dog lunged. He fell, and Cyril had a hold of him, 
and then he was like protecting Cyril because she was coming toward him. And it was icy. That's why he felt, but he didn't lunge at her just because it was her, but he did lunge. Um, we've had Winston for five years now. We've never had an issue with kids, other dogs, anybody. We've had people over to the house and in the yard, and he's never had a problem then with anybody. He barks at the door when the mailman comes or anybody he can't see, he barks until he knows who it is. But we've had little kids come to the yard. And we had one little girl, she used to come and unlock the gate all the time because she wanted to see Winston and never had an issue. All my great nieces and nephews, have, they've been out camping. They've literally hung off him to get up, to stand, and never had an issue. When he didn't want to be hang, have anybody hang on him, he just went away. Do you mind just telling us which one's Winston? There's like oh, multiple. Um, Is it the big oh, black? It's like, he's the big brown. The big brown one. The other little dogs are, um, are um, my stepdaughter's. Okay. dogs she has four of them but he's been around dogs the whole time we've never had an issue at the off-leash park as well we spoke to our neighbors they're agreeable with us they set out walking times if there's any change then we're to phone them or they're to phone us we have purchased a muscle muzzle and we have no problem putting a muzzle on him when he's out We've had a leash on him every time. He's not allowed out of the yard without a leash. We've always got a leash on him. She has her walking times. We have ours. And we can literally go to the park, which is a skating rink, two schools. And we have school kids. Um, they didn't get the pictures of the school kids, but I videotaped because they all come to Winston to pet him. And we've never had an issue. So, I mean, we're agreeable to no problem, the muzzle, and him being on a leash all the time. But being chained up, muzzled, and fenced in a fenced yard. The fence is five feet. Six. Six feet along the side. Five feet is the chain link fence. We did take pictures, but they didn't get it. We took the whole yard to where it is. We can lock the gate if we have to. We prefer not to, but it is a drop lock. So you physically have to lift the chain up to drop it through. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Like I said, they're the only ones and we don't know why. He did what he did that day. Like, we feel really bad that he did. And, I mean, we did check on him. It didn't just leave and say, oh, too bad, so sad or anything. But I really don't think he needs to be on the chain, like I said, in a fence, in a fenced yard. I totally get the leash as soon as he's going, leaving our yard and the muzzle, which is totally agreeable. But I just don't feel the rest of it because, like I said, <laughs> We had pictures, they just couldn't get them all, of kids in the schoolyard. They looked forward to seeing him during the week. So I don't know what else I can say. Or... Okay, well, we, I'm sure there'll be some questions, so we can just stay there. And uh, um, Councillor Kelly, you're first for questions. Thank you. Um, it's unfortunate we have to meet this way. I, I appreciate your concerns. The first incident happened approximately a year before the second one. In that period of time, did, did you folks take the dog for obedience training or any sort of remedial work at all to uh, help ensure that this would not happen again? We haven't as of yet. I have checked into the lessons they are well over $600. Neither of us are working right now. 
So the extra $600, I just don't have. But the minute Cyril goes back to work, we will be enrolling him, and I can provide proof that he will be going to. Um, I spoke to a lady about one-on-one -on -one lessons. So he, he heals right to you. And I explained that he had bit the neighbors. And she says there is ways to work with that as well. She even asked at that time if the neighbors would be willing to come to the classes as well, which we asked, and they are not, which I get. They don't want to add any problems there. But, yes, we will have him enrolled in an obedience class as soon as we can, hopefully within a month. Okay, thank you. But it hasn't happened yet, obviously. No. Um, how, what does your dog weigh? How much approximately? 80 pounds? Maybe it's about 90 to 100. Last time we were at the vets, I think he was 98. So it's not a small dog? No. Um, do you understand how a dog that size coming at you could be very frightening? Oh, totally. I was raised with uh, RCMP dogs, so I know <laughs> what it's like, definitely. But I'm more scared of little dogs. <laughs> but <laughs> I am I mean, not. I and get I it. I mean, if you've got a dog lunging at you and it's a big dog guy, I totally get the fear factor there. And I have one last question, if you would. For the right to use the streets in an unfettered, unencumbered, free way where you're not concerned about your personal safety in any way, shape, or form, do you think the dog's rights or the individual citizen's rights should have um, precedence? Well, I definitely feel that the people deserve the right first, but the dog should also have some rights. I mean, I understand we've complied, like, with when we leave the yard, he's on a leash, we have the muzzle, all of that. Um, I just don't see any of the other things that they're asking us to comply with, like the $2 million liability, the fence inside a fence with the dog chains inside a fence and a muzzle on just to be outside. I think that is overkill by a long shot. Mayor Catra, one last question and then I think I'm done. When the first incident happened and you received your first ticket, did you take the time to, to, to review the animal control bylaw of the city and uh, the potential cons consequences embedded within it? No, um, I can't remember. We were just told it was just better to pay the ticket and admit the guilt because they had the proof that he bit the neighbor. So that's what we did. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Blizzard. So the first time that the neighbor got the bite, um, was the dog off the leash at that point? The dog was out in the front yard with us, yes. And it had a habit of going off the property? No. So it just got lunged at the neighbor. Does the neighbor have a dog? No. Just wondering just why all of a sudden. doesn't like those neighbors. I don't know why. I really don't. Because I find them very nice, but he doesn't like them. I don't know whatever happened. But whatever happened, I know dogs don't forget. I don't know if that you can say something happened. I, you, yeah. Um, I walk a dog all the time. I come across all kinds of dogs. And yes, they do sometimes have sensitivities. Um, a friend's dog Question. growls at the same person. Yes, I have more questions. So yeah. the second incident, they said something about that the uh, lady was lunged at numerous times. How does she get lunged at? So is the dog on the leash in the front yard then? or At that time, when her husband got bit, he was not on a leash in the front yard. Ever since then, we set up and she said she would like him on a leash and we had no problem, fine. We didn't want any more issues. 
when he got when she got lunged at it was icy out that day Cyril fell and she was coming and that's why the dog lunged because he had let go of the leash no he didn't let go he oh. had the dog on the leash the whole time but it sounds like that wasn't an only time yeah maybe before that turn your speaker on Be before that uh, the uh there was one occasion when I was painting the front door and the dog was out with me and I had him on a long leash and it was long enough for he, she was walking down the street and he lunged at her, you know, in a friendly manner, you know, but still she scared, scared, yeah, totally dog scared with dogs. Yeah. That can be He's scary. A dog. Do you know what the legal length of a leash is? The one I had was 50 feet. That, that was one, you I know. I believe where it's I, where I'm going to ask after when they come oh, back but, up. But this is one where you turn the car screw into the ground. So they and, can't and get 50 off. feet, it wouldn't be off your property no, no, if no, it ran. No. You must have a big property. Yeah, it's, it's an older it's, area. It's an older area. Yes. Okay. Um, and the other good thing, because um, it has bearing on how this goes forward, is so are these direct neighbors? They're one house over. So their their fence doesn't butt up to your fence. Not oh. even close. No. Okay, they're removed. Okay, um, I'll leave it for now. I may have some more yet. Okay, um, I've got a couple questions. Um, I guess the first question that uh, do you understand the reason why the city would want you to get liability insurance if a dog is biting someone? Well, if he's like biting someone, like. Is do you not everybody have liability insurance on their house as it is? I don't know. That's a question. But that... most people that I know of have to carry some sort of liability on their home. Whether it's somebody walking up your walk and they fall, somebody falls in your driveway, you have to have liability insurance. Okay. You well, I, I was just asking if you oh. understood why they asked for the additional two million, and I can ask. Um, oh, okay, because I don't know Officer Sharp when he comes up. Um, so the other question that I have is: I know you keep saying that it's just that neighbor that this dog has a problem with, but what guarantees can you give? I guess this is the big question I have. What guarantees can you give that a the dog's not going to slip out when the dog or door opens that you know There's the fence no door is to open of your house we okay never... just wait for the question what guarantees can you give that this dog is not going to get off your property without being on a leash and then the second question to that is how confident and i mean to a hundred percent fault do you believe this dog would not attack somebody else I mean, that, that's very, you know, dog bites are very serious, so. Okay. Uh, the, first, the first question, okay, he will not ever get out of the yard without being on a leash. I guarantee that. And, you know, I, I just, he's in a fenced-in yard, and there's only one way he can out, is if, if he's on a leash. If we leave the house, he's automatically on a leash if he's coming out through the gate. Automatically. He leaves the house, he's clipped on a leash because we intend to take him out of the yard. Okay. And our front door doesn't open because that's where his bed is. So we'd have to move all that stuff just to open the front door. So we don't even answer the front door. We tell people to go to the side door. Okay. Councillor Noyan. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> and and I, I surely understand the distress that th this entire situation has, has caused you. Thank you for answering the questions here today. Um, my question is, would you be open to um, a higher fine should another incident occur? What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, there's... If I have ended, like, and I have every option of making sure this dog will not ever do this again, and yeah, if if it does happen again, yeah, whatever, you know, I I'm open to anything. The fine is now what? 
fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars is the fine, I think. Fifteen hundred, I believe. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That answers my question. That's it. Councillor Blizzard, further questions? So you mentioned you have a five foot fence. Can the dog jump it? No, I mean, that to me would be a concern because I've seen dogs six foot fence when oh, I walk by and I'm nervous. I've seen Yodis do it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that would be a concern. I've never even attempted it. And the other thing is, um, so you were told when you got the second one and that it was very clear you had two weeks um, to apply for this appeal and you'd missed that no, deadline. We, didn't. we got an email address from whoever handles, we sent the stuff to the email, only to find out after we called back to the people that issued the fine that that wasn't the right email that they had given us. So we had to phone the city to find out, to get the proper email to forward all the stuff. So you applied before December 8th? We were going to, but we didn't have the right email. We sent a letter, but it was a non-existent email. The information we had was you applied for this on December 15th and then the city didn't receive it because of that lack. So you, either way, you were late. Did, you weren't taking this serious or? Oh, no, we took just, it very serious. Yeah. But, but uh, the uh, Officer Sharp was good enough to phone us and ask us where and if we sent an appeal in because if not, there was a, a fine coming towards us. And we said, yes, we have. And he said, okay. So he phoned back about an hour later, and he said, where did you send it to? And I said, well, I'm down south right now, so I'll have to get back to you on that one, which I did. And I told him where we sent it to, and he was good enough to, to have us send it to the proper place, to uh, Cheryl Axley. Mm -hmm. And that's what we done. So that's why it was just later. Okay. Okay. That's all for now. Okay. okay. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. A question that arose just from your most recent comments, sir. When you travel, where is the dog? He's with us. When you travel, where do you, where do you? keep the dog oh, he's, he's in the vehicle with us or we take him to the kennel out at Lamont he's so never out when you were when you just mentioned that you were down south yeah so when you were down south for this particular trip the dog was where he was with us he was with us in the car you don't leave him with other people within the community Sorry, what was Sorry, that? Sorry, what was that? Do you leave him with other people in the community at any time? No, Sorry, no, Councillor no. Kelly, they're just having a hard time hearing you. No, never. No problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, that appears to be all the questions, so thank you. You can take a seat back there, and I'll invite Officer Sharp and uh, Ms. Rayner back. So at this point in time, Council has uh, an opportunity to ask some of the clarifying questions that you may have heard that weren't able to get answered. So I'll kick start it off with the the $2, two million insurance. So just so that everybody understands why an individual would need that on, a, on an animal. Your Worship, so I believe normally People's home insurance may cover something like that, but this is also to cover, like in this instance, did not take place on their residence at their home. It was at the neighbors. And so I don't believe regular insurance is going to cover that. Uh, so they would need this extended $2 million liability uh, for that reason. Okay. Thank you. And um, I just, I, I guess just the other question again, the dog's about 100 pounds, uh, and, and I know it's an opinion question again. Do you, in your opinion, uh, do you believe it's safe for this animal to be out even muzzled um, 
you know, if, if the neighbors have agreed to, you know, alternating walk times. I'm just, I, I think I got it in your first one, but I'm just looking for your, once again, you were there, you saw the dog, you, you know, you talked to the other person. So just further talk about just her fear and did she have any fear for any anybody else in the neighborhood? Your Worship, in my opinion, um, I would be confident with the animal being out if it's following the restricted dog conditions. So on a shorter leash or a chain and a muscle? Yes, so the restricted conditions, uh, they'd have to comply with a leash no longer than two meters, um, as well as a muzzle when it's out for a walk. Okay, and then, uh, so I just guess the last question, uh, in the compliance order, it's asking for a cage in the back? Your Worship, correct. So yes. your belief is the dog could, could escape out the backyard? I haven't been to the yard, so I don't know. Your Worship, in my opinion, a five-foot fence with a dog that size, I would not be surprised if it was able to jump over that fence, whether it would or not, I'm not sure, but in my opinion would have the capability to. Okay, and in the compliance order, so if, but if they're in the yard, the dog can run freely, but if they're not attending to the dog, it has to be locked up in, in a run cage. That's what the compliance is? Your Worship, so the compliance would be, it would have to be in that enclosed fenced pen as well as on a leash that cannot uh, reach within two meters, I believe, of that pen fence line. Okay. Okay. Councillor Blizzard, further questions? Uh, yep. <laughs> that sounds like a huge pen then, because if we get two meters away from it in. Um, so going by that, so five foot isn't enough in the fenced yard, but... I mean, I've watched movies, you see vicious dogs or some of the police dogs that are taught to, um, you know, attack people. If they're in the back and they're hissing and barking, I get all the rules, but it feels like a, almost a little bit of overkill to have them caged, muzzled, and chained in the yard. Um, is there a way to at least soften that up? I'm, I mean, the restricted I get a bit, that's dangerous. I would hate to have it, you know, we take that off and it happens again, but Okay. This just yeah. We'll let Miss Rayner answer. <laughs> Your Worship, through to Councillor Blizzard, um, Officer Sharp and I have discussed this, um, and thanks to the Mullins for for expressing their concerns. Um, it is a lot within our bylaw, and there are there. As I reviewed this, it we would have some leniency in there as far as the the enclosed pen within their bylaw is one thing that we can probably. Um, alter that condition as long as the dog is chained and muzzled still then we can work with them that way um, I understand that those conditions are quite strict and we have had instances with restricted dogs that needed the enclosed pen because they did jump the six foot fence and attack people so there are reasons why those conditions are very um, heavy-handed because there are instances where we really do need that. So if council wanted to, for the Mullins in this instance, remove the condition, um, and I can just read the condition there, it is, it, it is 8.6 within their order where the restricted dog shall be muzzled and secured in a fully enclosed holding pen when outdoors so they they will still have to comply with all of the other conditions mm -hmm. but that is something that we would be willing to to alter if if well, council which one was that I, somehow we don't have the i don't have the bylaw yeah, it's, in here it's attached yeah, it's a separate attachment it's a separate attachment it's not showing on mine though no it's there's three attachments. The order to comply it's the order to comply but it's not on there here appendix a Oh, is this it? No. Here. Councillor Blizzard, you can. Okay. Well, I just need, it's okay. I need it. So the number is eight point something? Sorry, or? it is, it is condition number 8.6C. C. Okay. 
okay, something to consider. And I get it. We wouldn't want to do that for every dog because I've come across them. I, like I say, I'm out on paths all the time. And the backyards sometimes are the scariest places for dogs because I I'm see some... asking questions. Yeah. Okay. No question. <laughs> I'll let the next person go. Okay. Councillor Noyan, further questions? Yeah, I'll just have one last question, and thank you for your answer about uh, a potential amendment to this. So I guess I'm going to have two questions then. So so basically removing 8.6 would solely require insurance and then the off-leash requirements. Uh, do we know that at like a ballpark cost of, of setting up an insurance policy like this? I have, I have no clue. Your Worship, through to Councillor Noy, and I'm not aware of that cost. Okay. And I guess my other question then for the other restricted dog licenses that we have issued in, in Fort Saskatchewan, uh, have they uh, stuck to the, the bylaw fairly rigidly, or, or have there been alterations made to them similar to, to what you proposed? Your Worship, through to Councillor Noy, and they have, they have complied with the conditions within the bylaw. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris? Um, this would be um, a question probably for uh, either Mr. Fleming or Ms. Walter uh, as it relates to legal liability. Um, so if we were to vary any of these conditions that are, that are precedent requirements in our bylaw, and we were to reduce the requirement, save the one of requiring the insurance policy, would it make sense that the city would then be named as a named insured under that sort of a policy uh, if we are reducing the context of, uh, you know, of the control that is named in the bylaw? All I'm getting at is to, you know, in, in other words, if we reduce the bylaw requirements in a manner and then the dog were to do something, get off the property, do whatever, and then ultimately cause somebody to be injured or, or worse, uh, would it be beneficial to have the city named as a named insured under Ms. that Malter? sort of policy? Uh, Your Worship, and through to Councillor Harris, um, I would need to look into that a little bit more to see what the city's requirements would be as far as being added as an additional insured. Um, the MGA does provide liability to council, to the city, uh, if you're acting in good faith. So okay. with that respect um you're okay we just have to confirm about the liability yeah I, i'm trying to get my head around you know the context of you know if there's any sort of a varying of the order so that's kind of why i asked that question thank you okay thank you councillor kelly thank you when you mentioned that this bylaw was up for review when will council see it your Worship, through to Councillor Kelly, I'm hoping to do the review and possibly bring it to Committee of the Whole by the end of the year and then fully, um, and, and in the new year, get it fully updated. So you anticipate then that we would have a new bylaw plus or minus 12 months from now? Through Your Worship to Councillor Kelly, that is correct. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that appears to be all the questions. So there is a motion that, um, so what is the wish of council? Councillor Macon? Should I just put on a motion then? Yeah. Uh, can I, can I amend the order to comply through the motion? Like with the removal of Sorry, I'm going to be between two documents here for one second. Uh, Your Worship, um, members of council, if your wish is to address the pen mm -hmm. that has been discussed, we do have something that has been prepared that we can put up and see if that's suitable. Okay. As a starting motion, Ms. Malter? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Point of order, Mayor Catcher? Yes. What is your point of order? I would I would suggest that we deal with the motion in front of us, and if there needs to needs to be an amendment to it, we do it that way. Okay, and there's no motion on the floor yet, so 
um, we can deal with this one. If this one fails, then we would go back to the motion that's being provided. Do you want me to proceed? So you can read whichever motion you want to put on, and then it'll be discussed and debated. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. I'll make the motion that administration alter the conditions of the restricted dog order issued to the Mullins by removing condition 8.6C. The restricted dog shall be muzzled and secured in a fully enclosed, enclosed holding pen when outdoors and reissue the order with a new compliance date of February 15th, 2023. Okay, well, I'll accept that motion. You can speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, this is a difficult one today. Um, I have two large dogs and um, I try to put myself in the place of these dog owners and in the uh, complainant's eyes. At the end of the day with dogs, we can't just say that it's just those two people because we have no idea why the dog did what it did and it can have the same feelings about anybody who walks by that home. Uh, so ensuring uh, the safety of residents and neighbors is of utmost importance. Um, we need to guarantee that the dog can't get out. Um, and I do think that this is prudent. Um, the reason why I went with the removal of 8.6C um, is that um, I do think it is a bit excessive for the dog that we've heard about today um, to be in a pen and chained and muzzled. I do believe if they have a well-constructed, um, and they did say it was six feet, uh, their fence, uh, that the dog on the chain and with a muzzle would be sufficient in my opinion. So um, I'm prepared to move that motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the motion is now open for discussion and debate. Councillor Harris. Um, Councillor um, uh, Macon. Um, this motion would remove the need to have to be mu muzzled while, while it's in the yard. Uh, my feeling would be that the dog should be muzzled, and I got the impression from the Mullins that they'd be prepared, well, if the dog is outside, that it would be muzzled at all times. But uh, I would tend to agree with you in terms of the need for a fully enclosed pen and, and uh, to be chained down. Um, is probably excessive, but I think that I wouldn't want to see the, the uh, requirement for muzzling if it's outside the house to be removed. So um, what's your clarification there? Are you suggest because you just said that you felt if it was muzzled, that would be okay, but this strict interpretation would remove the muzzling, the enclosure, and the chaining. That's the way I read this. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you want to reply to... Sorry, I forget. I have to push the button. Uh, I do apologize, Mayor Catcher. I did incorrectly read that. I believed that 8.6C was only removing the enclosure and not the muzzle and the chain. When I read it, I thought that I had that clear, but... Okay, I'm just going to go to Ms. Rainer. Rainer. Your Worship, through to Councillor Macon. So within the order, there are several conditions. And the next condition... Um, 8.6D does cover off that muzzling, so the restricted dog shall be muzzled and secured by a chain, preventing the restricted dog from entering within two meters of the premises boundaries when outdoors. So the condition is still there for the dog to be muzzled. Section C, just the way that it's worded within the bylaw, it is one of the conditions of muzzling and a, and a fully enclosed holding pen. So it has both of them, the way it's worded in the bylaw. Okay, thank you. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, I, I can live with that. Um, I, I thought the enclosure and the chaining was a little bit over the top. Um, I guess the, the other question that I've got is whether we can put um, a time specific on. That's why I asked the question earlier. Um, you know, if the, if, if the owners take the dog to, uh, to obedience training and actually, because it's a young dog, was it six years old? Five? Yeah, so you, you can have your dog for 15 to 20 years or more. So if the dog learns its lesson through appropriate behavior modification, then that should hopefully alleviate something. So, so that's kind of where I'm coming from in this thing too. So I, I, I don't necessarily throw that out right now, but how do we put a time specific, you know, with this? So do we vote on this? 
and then consider the potential of time-specific uh, limitations? Uh, you would have to put an amending motion on. Or I can do a subsequent motion after this one, right? Ms. Moulter, what's the preference? Um, I believe that is correct. A subsequent motion specific to timing would be appropriate. Yeah, okay. and because and, I don't want to muddy the waters because time and this are two different things. So thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Councillor Blizzard. Yeah, I'll support this. Um, yeah, I definitely feel the dog needs to be restricted, but I also feel like was brought up by Councillor Harris that maybe there should be a timeline. I think one way we could address it, though, is in that animal control bylaw that maybe that there is a way to have and maybe in stages you know, instead of just saying, oh, the dog did some lessons and out they go is maybe now it can go in the backyard without a muzzle. Now it can, you know, after a while. And once a dog's bitten someone, I don't think it ever should be walked again without a muzzle. Um, but anyways, that could be addressed in a bylaw versus us having a motion here. I don't know, maybe we can cover both, but maybe something to think about when you do that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you. I'll support this motion as it stands. I I think that the constrictive nature of having a dog in, in, in a separate enclosure in its own yard and muzzled in its own yard is is unnecessary given uh, the information that we have right now. Um, I I think that it's a it's a bit unfortunate that this has come all the way to council for for consideration for the fact that I think these interactions can happen and do happen. And I actually know of them happening and uh, on various occasions in, in our city, uh, other to, uh, other than this, but I, I think we've, we've, we've asked some good questions. There's, there's been some good consideration. I, I thank you to the owners for, uh, for coming today, but this seems like a reasonable middle ground that, that we can pursue as an avenue, uh, for recourse. Okay, thank you. I'm next in the speaking order. Um, I'm somewhat okay with this. I read the the D condition, and I'm still just the wording on the D condition as we go into that. So, shall be muzzled and secured, and from entering within two meters of the premises. So, does that mean if they bring the dog outside and want to put a screw in the ground, that as long as it can't get to two meters on either side of it so I guess I'm just looking for clarity that 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 what the intent is of of the D versus the C because the C to me is dealing with the backyard the D would be dealing more with the front yard if they came out and wanted to hook it onto the your, your mailbox or something so it couldn't get out you know Two meters. So, what's what's your interpretation of that? Because I'm lost. Your worship, through to counselor, or <laughs> through to your worship, um, it would just be within two meters of their premises. So it could be front yard or backyard. So it's it, essentially that dog is going to be chained while in the yard, and it has to be chained so that that chain keeps it away from two meters from from its property, so that it doesn't have that opportunity to bite or to to attack anyone. Okay, so. so if the fence is deteriorating, it can't get to that point of it? That's correct, Your Worship. Okay. okay, yeah, then I can probably support that based on your guys' recommendation, not mine, because I think you're more the experts of that. And, and if you feel comfortable enough with having that piece of it removed, just the pen part, I would probably be comfortable with that. Uh, Councillor Abatoye? Thank you. I definitely support the motion. Um, I think that's important that um, residents feel safe in their neighborhoods. Um, and I think this is one opportunity for us to ensure that um, I've never owned a dog myself in my whole life. Um, but I do know from friends that own dogs that, um, you know, dogs are like a family, you know. So I'm really pleased that um, the Molens have worked out um worked out something with their neighbors and hope that, um, you know, we don't see this kind of um, situations happening going forward. And I really support putting a timeline in this um, order and 
what I'm thinking is um, since the animal control bylaw is going to be reviewed in one year, um, it will be it will be good to check in with them to see how they've gone, how things have been, you know, and so maybe a one year timeline to for us to review and evaluate um, this order and see how we can, you know, slowly, um, you know, ensure that, um, you know, the dog gets, you know, um, the family gets what they want and in terms of safety that's the dog now it wouldn't bite anybody because it's been trained appropriately the way it should be um, so I definitely will support that timeline if it comes forward um, maybe one year especially to coincide with the animal bylaw um, control but um, I definitely support this um, right now um, I think it's important for us to keep our community safe thank you okay thank you Councillor Kelly Yes, thank you. I want to support um, the comments that the last three speakers made, Councillor Abatoy, Mayor Catcher, and uh, Councillor Blizzard. We have a bylaw that's coming up in a year. If at that time it's worthy of including in the bylaw some sort of um, parole provision that can be included at that time, uh, I would be of the opinion that a parole of any sort of nature would wouldn't be less than 12 months anyways. Um, I would further suggest that an automatic time limitation makes no sense. Time, the passage of time doesn't cure the problem, but that the, the dog in, in a future bylaw would in fact be observed and screened by, by our bylaw people to ensure that in fact, they, they are able to interact with people in the community in a safe and friendly manner. So let's leave it for that point in time. And I only mention that so the Councillor Harris knows the way I feel as well as the, as well as the others. Uh, I like dogs. We have not personally in my household, but in our family, uh, one large dog that is approximately 80 pounds. Uh, that dog does not go outside, period. That It's not on a leash. I have walked that dog. My wife has walked that dog. It does not show aggression to anybody, anytime. I believe dogs can be socialized and trained properly. Um, the dog is five years old. It should already understand those mechanics of interaction. And if it doesn't, I, I have concerns. It's a hundred pound dog. I don't want to walk down the street, even if it's across the street and have a hundred pound dog lunging at the end of a leash, trying to get to me. Not fair, not reasonable. And if that happened and the owner slipped on ice and I was afraid that the dog might get away, I would have heightened concerns. What we deal with here is the rights of our citizens. In my opinion, first and foremost, the animals are secondary, subject to their special rights of being an animal, but they don't have the right to be on the street unless they can be proved to interact properly. Strong words, I get it but I have zero patience for aggressive large dogs. I, did, I delivered papers as a youth in my small rural community where there were lots of large dogs. And at that particular time, no such thing as a bylaw or any enforcement whatsoever. I have no use for large aggressive dogs of any nature. The owners have a responsibility to properly train and properly manage the dog. And our animal control bylaws should actually stress that. that. When you get past 30 or 40 pounds, it's up to you to make sure that the thing is going to be all right. And it's not, we're not locking up the dog. It, and I would agree with the, with the wording as it's presented. I think probably it was overkill as well. But I have a question of administration as part of my comments. Um, Corrine does... Would, would enforcement be going back to, to confirm that in fact a a proper stake exists in within the yard to to allow the dog to be outside and not in a pen as described in the in the bylaw. Your Worship, through to Councillor Kelly, yes, Officer Sharp will go um, and confirm that on February the fifteenth. That will be the new compliance date, and they will confirm that all conditions have been met. And it might, in fact, be rather difficult to get a stake in the ground in the middle of the winter. What happens in that case? Your worship, through to Councillor Kelly, there are many ways that you can you can tie like chain and chain an animal. So, I guess they'll have to figure that out. 
But if it's if there is no stake, then what happens? Or no many other ways, no no proper way to restrain the dog in the yard. What happens? Your worship, through to council member, we when I would go to do the the inspection, I'd be looking for evidence of all of those things. So I'd be looking for the muzzle. I'd be asking for the certificate of insurance. For I'd be looking for some type of evidence that they have something in place that can keep that dog two meters from the property boundaries. So whether that be a stake or whether that be something else that they've constructed, as long as I'm confident that whatever method that they are using, when I go to do my inspection, that it cannot reach within that two meters, I will be satisfied at that point. And, and I get that. So what happens if you're not satisfied? What happens if they're unable to show a proper restraining device within the yard? So if they are not able to show a proper restraining device within that yard, uh, there could be a fine issued for not complying with the restricted dog order and the conditions within it. But I guess that's my point. Um, you said could. So in what circumstances, in your opinion, would the fine be issued? And what circumstances, in your opinion, would the secondary fine or the subsequent fine not be issued? The way, sorry. Go ahead. If the animal is never going to be out in the backyard by itself, then they may not require for that condition, I suppose, to be met if the only outside that dog is ever going to see is when it's being walked. However, as soon as that dog is in the backyard without that condition being met on that leash with that stake, then there could be or would be a violation ticket issued for that. Okay, now you're answering my question. Thank you. So if in fact at the middle of February, the ground does not permit the installation of the proper restraining device, you would then seek from the owners um, some sort of formal undertaking that in fact the dog will not be outdoors until 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 this is rectified? Correct. They, the dog would not be able to be outdoors in that backyard if it cannot be restrained within that two meter boundary. Okay, I think that answers it. Thank you. Okay, I actually had one more question and it uh, pertained to Councillor Blizzard's one that she had asked earlier about the length of leash that's allowed when they're out walking to be able to have control because I don't see a maximum uh, leash length and I think the Mullins said like their leash was like 50 feet or something. So would there be a requirement or is there something within this compliance that should say that it's no more than X number of feet if they're in the uh, front yard or, or out walking the dog? Because I wouldn't want to see this dog have a 50 foot run from the, from the owners. So what's the requirement on the leash length? Your Worship, for a non-restricted dog, there in our bylaw there currently is no restriction on that limit of length of leash. So I suppose that 50 meter leash, unfortunately, is uh, there will be no violation with that. However, if it is a restricted dog, there is a two meter length maximum. Okay, so it is in there. Okay, I didn't go back and read that. So I appreciate that. Councillor Blizzard. Oh. Okay, go ahead, try that. So restricted dogs then are not allowed in the off leash dog park, I'm gonna assume, right? Your Worship, through to Councillor Blizzard, they would have to be on a leash. Okay, they would be allowed, but that is on part a of leash their conditions. only. That's and correct. a two meter leash. Yeah, so okay. they can enter the dog and park. Muzzled. They would have to be muzzled and on a leash okay. while in the dog park. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we're going to close on this one. Councillor Macon. Uh, thank you for the discussion. I have nothing further. Okay, thank you very much. So we are dealing with this motion. It is now closed. Please cast your vote. Okay, so that's carried unanimously. So for the Mullins who are sitting here, Ms. Rayner and Officer Sharp will just walk you through what the next steps are. Okay? All right, thank you very much. Oh, sorry.
don't run away. I guess there's maybe another motion. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think at this point in time, we did talk about some time specific uh, nature of this. So I would suggest that I'd be prepared to move that the um, that the enforcement order is in place um, uh, until whatever the time you're talking about, February, whatever. Uh, after which point it will be reviewed to determine whether the condition should be continued. Okay. I'm just looking at Ms. Moulter to see if she can make a motion out of that. I think there's some more wording that it's required. I'm sure she can. Yes, if you could just, sorry, repeat what it was that well, you... Well, all I'm saying is that the, um, that the order will be reviewed um, after February 15th, 2024, to determine if the condition should be continued or varied. And consistent with what, in the background of that, consistent with our review of the dog bylaw, that may ultimately be some of the language or some of the, the context that is put into the bylaw during its review. So the dog is in jail for a year is really what I'm saying. Do you want a five minute recess to figure out some wording? Okay, we'll recess for five minutes. So 3.15. Councillor Harris, if you can go work with them on the motion. Of course.
missing. All right, we will resume the meeting. Councillor Harris, I'm still with you. Can you push your button on, please? Uh, in light of uh, discussion we had during the break, I'm prepared to withdraw the motion. Um, and um, what I've been led to believe by administration is, is that the uh, pending bylaw review would suggest that it would probably be within a yearish, and uh, that these things would be taken into consideration. And so, therefore, the um, uh, the dog would not be, um, you know, incarcerated for any longer than necessary. I'm not sure how we ultimately, at the end of this, determine whether the dog is good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but I guess that's a discussion for another time. So at this point in time, I'm prepared to withdraw the motion. Okay, thank you. So the motion is withdrawn. Uh, Councillor Kelly, did you have any motions or amendments on that? You're still sitting on my speaking list, so... I did not. I wanted to speak to Councillor Harris's motion. Now, not necessary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. We are good to go. So, as I said before, um, Ms. Rayner will speak to the Mullins and let them know what the next steps forward are. Thank you very much for coming out. All right, we will move on to Capital Project 21034, the culvert replacement, uh, Grant Schaefer presenting. He is virtual, and this one is for information, I believe. Uh, yes, thank you, Worship, and, and members of Council. Uh, my name is Grant Schaefer. I'm Director of Fleet Facilities and Engineering, and I'm here today to provide an update on Capital Project uh, 21034 Township Road 542 culvert replacement. I will share my presentation here. Sorry. Um, the 2020 annexation of lands within Strathcona County included Township Road 542 as our southern boundary. The culvert crossing uh, Point of Pinch Creek um, was included in our inventory and annual inspection programs. The culvert inspection in 2021 identifies structural failure of the culvert as a portion of the top of the arch has collapsed. A preliminary engineering report was completed in the summer of 2021 to explore options for the repair or replacement of the culvert. Project 21034 was presented as part of the 2022 capital budget um, to replace the culvert at a cost of uh, $1,250,000. Council referred the project pending discussions um, regarding traffic accommodation and potential funding partners. Through 2022, discussions were undertaken with Strathcona County and gravel operators regarding detour routes and potential funding. Um, none of the parties were interested in discussing cost sharing arrangements. Uh, traffic mitigation strategies were discussed and agreed to in principle. Final details we worked out as we moved through the detailed design of the, of the call replacement. Um, the agreed to strategy is to allow the gravel haulers to haul full weight loads through the spring and summer, so not to put um, uh, load bands on through the spring. This will allow them to haul material off site to stockpile prior to the road closing for construction. This strategy will align well with the construction timing as permitting of the crossing is likely to take three to six months, pushing the construction start into late summer fall. As well, other options will be explored during the design to determine if portions could remain open adjacent to the construction process. The funding was approved um, for the project as part of the 2022 budget, with construction being delayed until discussions had taken place. With these discussions now complete, uh, providing an update on where we got to, I guess, and the project is planned to move forward with detailed design with construction anticipated in fall of 2023. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've got Councillor Harris first for questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, um, Schaefer. Schaefer. I just looked down your name, it disappeared. Um, so where would the um, uh, gravel haulers, the gravel or, uh, miners or whatever they do, where are they going to haul this stuff to? Uh, where are you proposing or where are they proposing for off-site storage? Because where they are right um, now is great off-site storage, <laughs> although it's on-site. Your, your Worship to, to Councillor Harris, they indicated they had um, locations that they could haul to. 
um, where they exactly were um, wasn't part of the details we discussed, but it was they had uh, locations that would work for them. So the way I understand this, then they would be allowed to continue to haul reduced weight loads to a certain extent. Is that the way I understand? Uh, no, Your Worship, we wouldn't put um, weight restrictions on. Would they be able to, uh, the full legal load, 100% axle weights? Um, normally in the spring, that gets reduced down to 80. Um, we would allow them to haul the, the full 100% um, axle weights. Um, the agreements have them maintaining the road anyway, so they're running graders on there to uh, to maintain the road for any additional potholes and damage that's done. And then um, we'd be able to shut the road down in the fall. Um, for the construction. Okay, so the uh, hauling off site allows them then to continue to sell material, but from an alternate site. Okay, I was a little bit loosey on that, so thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, clarifying questions? Yeah, thanks, and thank you, Mr. Shea, for your, for your report. Um, I'm assuming, but can you can you clarify that you went down to this site and were walked around um, to to see the condition of the road that has ponds around it already? That was a potential access for this site. Um, your worship, the council knowing and that was one of the the uh, the routes that we had discussed. Um, the the owner of that site um, was not confident that that road would hand up hold up to the hauling through there. It's been a number of years since they've used it. Um, for any kind of hauling um, of any um, bulk material through that site. Um, and they were, their concern was that the road would actually completely fail um, with the ponds on both sides saturating the road. Okay. And then so it was deemed by uh, the, the mining operator that uh, that stockpiling it offsite was more cost effective than building a road or was that cost effective or was that uh was that because their road would not hold up to the amount of hauling needed to be done during the season um your worship counselor Noy, and they felt that that hauling off site was the best option for them rather than trying to uh to maintain a road that they weren't confident in the subsurface on the surface they can deal with but when you have to rebuild from the bottom up, especially with water on both sides, it'd be very difficult. Okay, uh, just uh, one more question further about the maintenance of, of the road, uh, the, the Township Road 542 uh, during during the summer because they won't there won't be any road bands uh, placed on, on the operators. Uh, are they also going to surface the road accordingly and not just grade it? Um, your worship to Council Noy, and that's correct. They have uh, maintenance agreements in place that require them um, to grade and, and adjust material as required um, through those agreements. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that'll all be okay. Thank you. Just a quick question. So if they're going to be using uh, Wiltshire Boulevard, um, is there going to be any conditions? What, what conditions are you putting on it, like for them to use it or like wait? Um, yeah, Your Worship, there's, there may have to be um, a couple loads going up through Wilshire during the fall if they didn't plan for something. The intent is that they wouldn't be doing that. If they did, we would be putting restrictions on in terms of, of weight hauling, number of trucks, time of day, those kinds of things. But the plan is not to actually have them come through the city. Um, we'd be closing the road, and then the trucks wouldn't be allowed through there. Okay. Okay. Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you. That just triggered a, a further thought. Uh, it, it, so is it possible to allocate our, our commercial vehicle enforcement uh, officer to, to monitor, uh, I guess, the, the, the amount that has been hauled through this area if that should occur uh, and this project goes ahead this summer? Through your worship. Um, your worship, I don't know that I can I answer Ms. that one. Ms. Cowie, can it, Ms. Cowie can answer that one, Mr. Schaefer. Um, through your worship to Councillor Noy, and I'm sure that we could work in partnership with Grant's team to figure something out. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Thanks. Okay, there doesn't appear to be any other questions. So, oh, okay, Councillor Kelly. Sorry, Mary Catcher, I was a bit slow getting my request in. Um, the intent of the arrangement, Mr. Schaefer, from my perspective, is that no trucks will end up using uh, the streets, paved surfaces within the city limits, essentially, of Fort Saskatchewan. 
you're suggesting that that still might happen. I'm wondering why. I would, it would seem to me that the proper message to put forward to the, to the company involved is get your stuff stockpiled because the road's going to be closed for this period of time. Um, you should be Councilor Kelly, and that is the, the intent and the message we've given. It's just I don't want to um, over-promise at this point. Um, there may be some things that happen that we can't foresee. Um, even our own construction traffic to be able to access, access that site may have to go around that way. Um, so there may be a say there's no trucks is going to be tough to say because we, they could be our own contractors to access the site um, during different times of that construction. Okay, uh, I get your conundrum. I, I, uh, our own trucks are limited in number when you're in a gravel operation. Those, those, those operations can run hundreds of trucks per day. So, so I, I, I'm not Truly, I don't think we should be even offering that as an alternative. The arrangement is negotiated. Get your material stockpile. Yeah, and in your worship to Councilor Kelly, that is what's been done. Um, it wouldn't be, if, if there was something that needed to come out, it would be like five trucks over three days kind of thing. We're not talking hundreds of trucks a day. We would definitely be putting any kind of restrictions on if something came up. But the intent is to shut down the hauling out of that, those sites. Um, once construction starts. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schaefer, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. That appears to be all the questions. So then just next step, uh, your tendering, construction will happen in 2023 and you'll provide us updates in your construction uh, yeah, that's update. Correct, yes. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, the next one that we have is uh, new business, boards and committee policy and procedure, Andrew Kaiser presenting. Good afternoon, your worship and members of council. My name is Andrew Kaiser, and I'm here to uh, provide an overview of the proposed changes to the municipal boards and committees policy and procedure. And of course, answer any questions that council may have. As stated in the report before you, the review of the boards and committees policy and procedure was conducted in, a, excuse me, in accordance with the policy development and management policy, which sets out timeframes for reviewing policies both of administration and of council. As this document was due for review in accordance with those timeframes, we have brought it back to council for review and adoption. There are relatively minor changes proposed throughout the policy and procedure, which center around uh, primarily formatting that is consistent with current templates, clarifying committee performance management expectations, as well as phrasing edits to help with ease of interpretation. I would also like to note in the tracked changes versions of the documents before you, there are some blank or mostly blank pages. Uh, that's just an unfortunate formatting issue with uh, page breaks and track changes in Microsoft Word. So it's not missing anything, but uh, that's uh, essentially it for my presentation. So I welcome any questions uh, council may have. Okay, thank you. So we'll open it up for questions. I can kick this one off. Section 4.3.2, you have an age limit of minimum uh, 18. What are your provisions that you have for our youth who are on boards and committees? What's the provision there? Perfect. Thank you for your question, Your Worship. Uh, so to Your Worship, um, yeah, there was a correction. The 18 years of age was a provision that was already in there, but we just made a phrasing change to make it at least 18. And um, as for the Youth Council, there is in Section 4.3.4, um, just a few points after that, it does say that council, uh, sorry, <laughs> council may appoint a youth or other, other public member to a committee should the appointment be deemed appropriate. And of course, with youth council, um, there are terms of reference that set out separate age guidelines. And in the youth council terms of reference, those ages are uh, 14 to 24. So that appointment would be okay. deemed appropriate. Um, Sorry, I missed that one because oh. it was in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I'm good. <laughs> Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation, Andrew. Um, 
So my question is just looking at the procedures um, in the um, the council procedures, um, the evaluation checklists. And my question is, do we have a method, a mechanism that we check with council members on what to think about the viability of a board or committee is? Because it looks like um, administration does have that, but um, do we have a mechanism to check with council members? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Abatoy, um, the evaluation check checklist or a sheet that you're looking at, um, that's an optional uh, checklist for a committee to review their effectiveness in terms with or against their mandate letter, bylaw, or, uh, or otherwise. Um, council could at any time uh, effectively review the validity or effectiveness of a committee. Uh, there's no kind of... Um, protection from that review contained within the procedure. So if council feels there is an intervention or review needed, that could happen at any time. So, so who currently uses this, this evaluation checklist? Sorry, was the question that who completes the evaluation checklist? Yeah, who currently, who currently uses that checklist? Okay, thank you. So through your worship to Councillor Abatoya, that uh, checklist is recommended to be completed by the chair of uh, that committee along with administration. Um, so that's something that um, is done, we recommend annually or as needed. Yes, I'm putting my first question back again. Um, so it feels like it's administration and maybe the board chair, but is there a me mechanism that we check in with council members on the viability of, of, the, of the boards or committees? Is there anything that addresses a way that we can check in with council members? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Abitoy, uh, I'm not sure there's anything that specifically mentions uh, council intervention, but of course, since these committees are created by council, uh, council can um, evaluate them at any time or issue a mandate letter uh, or require that they report to council. It's just not a mandatory provision because some of the committees by their nature, um, say the assessment review board or the subdivision development appeal board, they're very closely monitored by administration and having them report to uh, council annually doesn't um, really make sense in terms of their mandate. So um, otherwise, yeah, council can at any point. I ho hope I'm answering your question, maybe. Not really, because uh, what I'm looking for is, is a check-in from administration with council members on various boards and committees to say that, okay, um, how, is, how is this committee doing? Do you think that it's actually meeting its mandates? Is it still viable? Does it still make sense, right? Because I'm saying that because of one of the um, committees I've been on, and, and um, I know I checked in with uh, the um, staff member on that committee, and that's why I'm asking that question. Okay, I'm going to actually go to Mr. Fleming on that because this is a little more out of the scope of this, Mr. Fleming. Yeah, through your worship, I, do, I don't know that that's something we need to put in the policy. Perhaps it could just become a matter of practice per se. Um, you know, again, it depends on the committee. Some of our committees are very closely monitored and they meet often and some committees are, um, they, they, they don't meet as often and, and they're, um, their purpose is a little more clear. So I, I don't really have an answer for that in terms of how you would put that in a policy, but um, I, I think it's something we could maybe talk about after the fact and just, and, um, and see if there's a practice we could adopt. Thank you. I'm okay with that. Okay, good. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. Andrew, I, I'm certain I know the answer to this, but uh, I just want to confirm this policy applies only to boards and committees that are established by our council or the Council of Fort Saskatchewan. And then, therefore, by definition, does not apply to, for instance, Heartland Housing or the Water Commission or the Wastewater Commission. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, that would be uh, correct. So those... Um council appointments to those committees would be separately handled by the council committee appointments policy gov 17 and um, the provisions for those would be separate from this document thank you okay thank you councillor noyan 
Yeah, thank you. So subsequent question, why is the RVA listed under 4.4.4 uh, public member expenses. This isn't wasn't my question, but I just triggered it, seeing that the, we have this this board listed in the document. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, um, so I may have misinterpreted Councillor sorry Councillor Kelly's question in that um, council appointments to those committees is handled uh, mostly separately, but for public members, because I believe there is a public member appointed to the River Valley Alliance, yeah. um, oh, that okay. would be this uh, policy. They're kind of uh, left hand, right hand documents. So okay, that, that's fine, that answers my question. Um, and, and I just wanted to talk about training for SDAB and ARB. Uh, and it was one of the amendments that you made uh, SEAB training from four years down to three. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking, and this is just my thought pattern, is that uh, it would be good to align with a with the municipal term, uh, uh, the, the 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 training requirement term <laughs> as well. So, and if it's not once every four years, then wouldn't be logical to have it once every two years, a divisive of of four. And, uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, that adjustment was made because of the current requirements under the Subdivision Development Appeal Board regulation. Okay. So the three years is actually prescribed by the province. Okay. So we just did that to mirror that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly? I thought you and I understood each other, Andrew, but your comment caused me to get back online here. Specifically, this... This policy refers to boards and committees established by council. If the board and co or committee is established by provincial regulation, then this policy would not apply. That's, I think, maybe a better phrasing of my question. And thank you for, uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, thank you for phrasing it. Uh, may I ask you to repeat it again, though? <laughs> You bet, I'll try. Um, the policy refers to boards and committees established by council. Not all of our boards and committees are established by our council or by the council of the city. Um, Heartland, for instance, was established by provincial order. The Water Commission is established by provincial order. The Wastewater Commission is established by provincial order. Um, those boards operate under their own mandate, subject to a different set of rules, and this policy does not apply directly to them. Is that correct? So through your worship to Councillor Kelly, I, I do now see where there might be some confusion as in the definition of what constitutes a committee in terms of this policy and procedure. It does uh, state uh, or other body established by council. So... Um, if that can be taken as maybe a friendly amendment to uh, modify so that it's more inclusive of the other uh, committees which public members might be appointed to, uh, we can make that change. And, and I don't think, again, I'm being clear, Andrew, I appreciate your, your, your participation in this. I personally don't think that it should be, sub that those other boards should be subject to this. Uh, again, I welcome administration's comments. Um, because one of the one of the requirements under the procedure is that council council members will not chair the committee. Um, some of those outside committees only have council members. For instance, okay, I'm going to go to Mr. Sorry. Fleming. Yeah, Councillor Kelly, I'll, <clears throat> I'll give you my understanding of it, and if it's if, if that's not correct, I'll ask the ledge to jump in. But everything you said is exactly correct. That this policy is only for the city established committees, except in the rare instance where there's an outside externally established committee where we have to appoint public members to it. And that's why the RVA is sort of the exception. So everything you said is correct, but, but we also use this policy to help with the appointment of a public member to those external bodies where, where council is required to appoint somebody. Heartland Housing has public members, but in that case, the board recruits their own public members right so i think you're really close to being correct but there's just that sort of one exception is that exception mr fleming clear to you in the reading of this policy 
Uh, yeah, through your worship, I'd have to go back. I, I guess I've just always known that, but I'd have to go back and see how the policy reads specifically on that. But I don't think, Mayor Catcher, that it's 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 a large issue, but I think we want to be clear on what this policy applies to. Um, I'm comfortable leaving it as an uh, administrative amendment, sub minor administrative amendment. Um, I just would like to see that that, the, that it be worded so that it's clear, Counts, future council and the citizens know exactly what we're talking about in this policy. Okay, I'm just taking a look at that. Uh, exactly which portion would we want a slight amendment to? I just need to. That's a good question. I'm looking at, I'm, what triggered it for me was under the council procedure, 2.4. It's a new new line, red line. Committee means an agency, board, committee, commission, or other body established by council. So to me, that's clear. I just wanted to make sure that that was the intent and that there was no confusion. And now I'm, I'm, there, there is one wrinkle to it where public members, if council appoints public members, they're subject to this, or council subject to I don't know. Now, all of a sudden, I don't understand really clearly how this works. Mr. Fleming, do you have a suggestion? Because I'm not seeing that on here when I'm looking at it. It's on the Appendix B. On Appendix B? Yes. Okay, I've got two track changes, so uh, 2.4. Correct. Under the, yes, council procedure. Because it does say, or other body established by council. So I'm just looking, it means agency, board, committee, commission, or other body established by council. So you're saying that you're interpreting that, that that's not a board or committee that's in, you're, you're feeling that that's something that's not clear as far as that? Because I would take that as all of those would be established by council. I, all of what, Mayor Catcher, please? Pardon? You said all of those would be established by council. When you said use the word those, you're referring to? To the 2.4 in the track changes B, Appendix B. Correct. Okay, so my, my, I was originally just seeking clarification. I don't want to make this harder than it is. Um, with the wording of 2.4, I think Mr. Fleming and I agree 100%. Boards such as Heartland, which are created by provincial order, are not subject to this policy. And, and I, I think we both agree on that. What confused me a little bit was the added comment about it applying to this policy, applying to boards or committees that are not established by council, but that require council to input or, or provide members from the public as board members. And there's where I got confused and I'm not sure that's clear in here. If it is, please tell me and we can move on. If it isn't, I'd like it corrected. Ms. Walter. Uh, Your Worship, I'm just wondering if it would help uh, to clarify the situation at the end of 2.4, where it says um, body established by council or uh, this, where the city appoints public members so that it ties that together. Because I understand that this is not all of the committees that council has, but what we're tying that is the public member appointments. Which is, Would that clarify it for you if we just had a wording change put in there? I think that would work, Mayor Catcher. I'm just looking for clarity. So I I'm think just, that works. I'm just going to ask by consensus without having to do a motion. Does anybody have any issue with them just adding those few words on there and that will appear in the next rendition of this? Okay. You're good with that? Okay. All right. So I think we're at the time for a motion. Somebody would like to, Councillor Noyan. Find it. Oh, go ahead. 
So I'll move that council adopt the revised municipal boards and committees policy and procedure gov 007-C. Thank you. Uh, so um, would you like to speak in favor of it? Yeah, I can. I think it's it's very important to revise this document uh, as legislative okay. services is doing. I think I think you've have scrutinized it and and you you've looked into it and reworded some things and and, and uh, some changes that, that that need to be done every once in a while. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, your answers to the questions for clarity to this council and and uh, and that that'll be all. Thank you. Are there um, any discussion and debate on the motion? Not seeing any. Anything on close? Nothing further. You're good. Motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. That's seven in favor. That's carried unanimously. The next one that we will go to is City Naming Policy and Procedure, Gov 002-C. For adoption, Mr. Kaiser. Thank you, Your Worship. I will now provide an overview of the proposed Excuse changes. Excuse me, Your Worship. We needed two separate motions, one for the policy and one for the procedure. There's only one here that says policy and procedure. Yes, we apologize. They, they have been split since the last time it, it was presented to Council. Okay, so then, the, so that's for the policy and the next one. So, if you'd like to read that in for the procedure, there isn't a motion. There's just use the same one, but say for procedure. Yeah, I'll move that council adopt the revised municipal boards procedure. Correct of zero zero seven C. Or is that not the right number for procedures then? It's on the board. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Did you wish to speak in favor? Uh, no, nothing further, no. Anything further on discussion and debate? Not seeing any. I'm going to close the motion. Please cast your vote. That's carried unanimously. So just out of curiosity, so did that just not transfer onto ours with two motions or what happened on that? Uh, that's correct, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Kaiser, move us along. Thank you, Your Worship. I will now provide an overview of the proposed changes to the city naming policy and procedure recommended for council's, council's adoption. Uh, again, the review of this policy and procedure is also being conducted in accordance with the policy development and management policy and its timeframes for review. The city naming policy and procedure is, in essence, a way for, city, or for the city to honor and reflect uh, the unique history of the community, its culture, and those, th those who have made a significant contribution or effort to making the city a better place. As stated in the report before you, the proposed changes to this policy and procedure are mainly for the purposes of encouraging the recognition of the city's indigenous culture and tradition, and of course, the overall diversity of the city's population. Secondly, um, more clearly granting uh, council some additional authority to remove names from the naming registry or any assets to which the name has already been applied. Uh, third, clarifying the naming authorities of the subdivision authority and council. And finally, some phrasing edits and uh, formatting to make it more consistent with other uh, policies and procedures. And that concludes my presentation. I would welcome any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. So we'll open it up for questions. Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Thank you for noticing, Mayor Catcher. Uh, I, Andrew, I'm looking at paragraph 4.3.2. And I'm wondering why administration has seen fit to, to word it the way you have. It explain it by explanation. I'm not at all convinced that being on the registry the longest necessarily makes that particular name or choice the best. 
And I, I would strongly suggest that we remove 4.3.2 and leave it up to those that are making a selection in the day to choose the best name they have. Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, thank you for uh, the question. In 4.3.2, um, the critical word there, the operative word is may. So again, it's, as you said, it's the person making the motion to grant the, uh, or apply the name. They may give preference to, uh, to those that have been on the list the longest. It, it doesn't require or compel you to do so, but it's, um, it's a statement that was in the previously um, uh, approved document and we just made a phrasing edit. I, th I think the intent is still consistent. Yeah, I, I don't recall being on council to approve the previous one. So here I am now, Andrew. I, I, I just think that it's not necessary. Um, and, and I, when it gets to the proper time, I might give council a chance to, to tell me I'm wrong. I, thank you. I appreciate your comment. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just don't think it's necessary. Appreciate your comment. Okay, thank you. So I'll go next. In uh, section 4.1, uh, 4.1.8, it talks about uh, the procedures about removing names, registers, but at no place in here, and, and I'll ask this because I may put a suggestion out there, uh, does it actually talk about, you know, the length of time somebody's name's on there is, uh, because some of the names may no longer be relevant, so I'm questioning, is it, uh, would it be wise to have just a, a little other statement in there, because it talks about naming it for if or taking somebody off if if you know they've done something bad but could we not just put or otherwise determined by council so that uh, you know the council of the May day may look at it and say there's the name on there that's been on there for 20 years and it's really no longer relevant or you know and there's no time frame so what are your thoughts on that uh, to your worship so um one of the comments you made was regarding the time frame, and a time frame wasn't put in this document or proposed uh, for addition or adoption because, um, in essence, if the name meets the criteria and that person or entity has made a significant contribution, effectively that uh, contribution wouldn't expire, so to speak, or the relevance. But um, the council does have the ability to... Uh, make that decision that it's removed. There just wasn't a time frame uh, put onto it because with different uh, requirements, that piece of infrastructure to which council feels that name applies the most might not be developed for a certain period of time and we, we didn't want names to age out, so to speak. Okay, so I understand the time limit, but does the document actually speak to the fact that, you know, a council may come in and look at them and say, gosh, these ones, you know, really aren't relevant or, and I understand you're saying criteria and that but you know I know some names were put on a number of years ago that just came out of a naming contest and it was like are they still really relevant so I guess I'm just looking for clarification on how do we determine you know each council the relevancy of names sure thank you your worship for the question so um I do think that uh an amendment, as you mentioned, just kind of tacking on to the end of uh, 4.1.8, that it can be at the discretion of council uh, would be appropriate or in alignment with the intent. I mean, if council feels, we, we kind of just put in the threshold of the, um, the dishonor um, to the city, community, province, or country as almost like a threshold for consideration for removal. But if council deems it appropriate, that could be... Um, some authority that's added there through amendment. Okay, well, I'll continue on with the questions, but at the end of it, I may just ask if there's consensus because it's only a few words and it's not a major, wouldn't be a major amendment. So um, I'll ask council about that at the end. Councillor Noyan? Yeah, thanks. Uh, is the naming registry a public document? Because I wasn't able to find it. I just saw a link to, uh, to apply for the naming registry or to have, have a new name put on the naming registry. Uh, so through your worship to Councillor Noyan, thank you for the question. That uh, The document as it stands right now is kind of an internally managed document that uh, isn't 
forward facing, not to say that it can't be. And we did talk about that during the review. Um, it was never really content of the policy or procedure as to how it's kept or presented. So you don't see that here, but we've talked about making it a accessible document on the website. And, and so, is there value to that? It hasn't been requested before to be a public document or? I'm not aware of any requests um, as to the content of the name registry. Um, okay. But, uh, we ever uh, no, I don't think we've had a request like that before. Fair enough. So. Thanks. I'll have a motion uh, for a small amendment to, to to the document at the end after questions. Okay. Councillor Harris, questions? Uh, two questions. Uh, first is, what's the attrition rate uh, for our registry? In other words, how frequently do we choose something? Because it really comes down to, in terms of what we're naming, um, we got a new ice rink, so it's going to be the whatever, and it would come off of that. So what, what's the typical attrition rate from what you guys have seen in the past? So um, usually when someone applies, they have kind of a type of asset um, assigned to it or something like that. In terms of the application rates, I'd maybe have to look to Ms. Axley. We have... A, uh, Your Worship, through Councillor Harris. Um, actually, I got the registry in front of me. So the last uh, submission that we received was back in uh, 2019. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So, second question. So, when we're dealing with um, the creation of streets, and names, and new subdivisions, that ob obviously goes through the subdivision approving authority, and it's not going to be something like. Uh, Joe Smith is, was a prominent physician, and we're going to now call this Joe Smith's subdivision. That's really up to the developer to bring the recommendation for it. So in other words, Windsor, for example, if we look at that as a, as a developed neighborhood in West Park, West Park would typically be starting with a W of some type, and uh, Windsor was something that the developer Qualico brought forward and said, we want this to be Windsor, and then we will follow suit with names for parks and, and that, that sort of stuff. Is, is that a correct interpretation? Through your worship to Councillor Harris, there is content in here. I, I'm <clears throat> not on the subdivision authority, so I can't really speak to the um, nuanced application of naming uh, those roads. But in terms of uh, what's in the procedure document, that is set out that they work with the developer in the application yeah. of those names and that they're consistent. Um, Suffice to say, we've got two streams here is what I'm trying to get at. We've got a stream of public venues or public facilities that ultimately come about and need to be named or renamed, and ultimately okay. that follows out of the name registry process, and then we look at something that's applicable for that particular venue or asset, if you will, as opposed to the subdivision stuff relative to we're going to have a ton of new subdivisions in the future, and those will ultimately come through the normal development process. Is that correct? Uh, I'm going to go to Ms. Smith on the subdivision. So you, uh, you are correct. Okay, good. Well, I'm happy with that then. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, Okay, not seeing, okay, um, just taking a look here. Just give me a second. So I'm going to ask council. I can put a motion. I can give up my chair. I can, or I can ask if council would be willing to um, have on section 4.1.8 the words added or as otherwise determined by council. Is there anybody who would object to that being added to that? Mayor Catcher, would you repeat, please? That's on Appendix B, track changes. Appendix B. I, no, I am there. Just repeat your addition. Oh, or as otherwise determined by council. So basically, it's giving council the ultimate authority if there was a name that they did want to have removed or something for some other purpose other than the purposes of somebody being notorious. That's 4.1.8. Thank you, Mayor Catcher, but I think that's already contained in there, is it not? 
Council at its discretion may alter, waive, um, including renaming, re removing names from the naming registry where the names may be associated or recognized with a significant dishonor. Your, your concern is that that specific ability of council to remove a name is associated only with a specific dishonor yes. and you would like it to be honored? Yes. Could we not just remove the word, the reference to specific dishonor and accomplish the same thing? Okay, I'm just looking for count. Does anybody have a preference? You're saying remove dishonor. I'm saying just add the words at the end. Because oh, I think dishonor comes in more than one place, doesn't it? Yeah. Councillor Macon? Oops, sorry. Um, I'll just add, I think that Councillor Kelly is right. Your intention is already included in 4.18 because it's saying council at its discretion may alter or waive the requirements, but it but it says including the renaming of city assets or removing the name registry. So I do think that your intention is actually okay. captured without change. Okay. If council feels it's already captured, then then I'm good with that. It's captured on record on video for whatever it comes up. So. Uh, if it ever comes up again. Okay, so no, I'm good with that. Uh, Councillor, uh, let's see. Councillor Noyan, you want to put a, a an amending motion on, so I'm just going back. You know, paper works so much faster for me than flipping back and forth here. Okay, are you making, uh, you want to make a revision to the naming policy or the procedure? The uh, document, uh, gov002-C, City naming policy, sorry. To the policy. Um, okay, so I'll take a motion to adopt it, and then you can put an amending motion on that we'll, okay. we'll discuss, okay? So if somebody would like to put the main motion on. Councillor Harris. Just a sec. I would move that council adopt the revised city naming policy, gov-002-C. Okay, thank you. Would you like to speak in favor of the uh, motion? Um, no, I don't think there's much more to add. Okay, discussion and debate, and that's where you would make your amending motion. Go ahead. Yeah, I believe uh, Wedge Services has, has my amending motion. So just wait for it to be displayed. You can read it. Councillor Kelly, now are you talking on the main motion right? Uh, you've buzzed in. Are you buzzing in for the main motion or for something? If, another, another amendment when we're done with this one. Thank you. Okay, just so that I know what order I'm doing. Okay. So I'll, I'll move that. Uh, I'm not sure this is exact wording because so I don't have it, but I'll move that uh, se section 4.1.2 of, oh, thank you, that council amend the city naming policy of Gov 002C by revising section 4.1.2 to state, reflect the city's heritage, its celebrated history of indigenous and settler cultures and traditions, community spirit, diversity, geographical features, the flora, fauna, and natural features of the community, and other attributes that are representative of the city or region. Okay. Would you like to speak in favor of your motion? Yeah, I can. It's it's a very Isn't small. Pardon? Isn't that already in there? What you just read? There's some small wording changes. Uh, so I'll I'll just speak to my motion then. So um, the the existing track changes uh, I believe can be improved uh, by being inclusive of of all peoples and cultures in the formation and building of, of Fort Saskatchewan to what it is today. And I would like to see that acknowledged in, in the, the naming convention. My intent is, is to uh, encourage a reflection on uh, in historical entirety um, with, a, with the diversity of peoples who have inhabited and, and built Fort Saskatchewan to what it is today. And that's it. Okay, thank you. That is open for discussion and debate. An amendment. 
Not seeing any. Oh, sorry. Councilor, Councilor Harris? Mm. Oh. oh, okay. Okay, and Councilor Kelly, yours is on something else, right? Just checking the order, okay. Anything on close then, Councilor Noyan? I, I don't think so. Okay, we'll close the motion for uh, these minor changes to this section. Um, sorry, excuse me. I'm not able to see it online. Are you are you able to put it back on the screen so we can read it? Okay, it's on the screen. Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Catcher, my comment relates to this. To this amendment. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's just a bit of a time lag between me asking for permission to speak and you receiving it, and sometimes we get hung up there. I appreciate your response. Um, help me understand, Councillor Noyan, what specifically does your amendment accomplish? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think it's what, what I'm trying to accomplish is, is to be inclusive in nature to uh, to cultures. I think that the sense of community that we have in, in Fort Saskatchewan is is established and will will continue uh, if, with the wording of this motion. So um, in essence, it's yeah, it, 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 it includes and acknowledges a, a, a diversity of of backgrounds who who have been in the Fort Saskatchewan area to, uh, you know, to to build it to what it is. Uh, today and, and and I think a reflection of of the the wording of the, this section as as I'm presenting will will be instrumental and maybe not instrumental well but could affect uh, potential naming uh, conventions of the future. Does that help answer your question? Not really. What words have changed? Because I can only look at one version at a time, and this has just been announced here within the last few minutes. So, what words changed? from the original wording to allow you to accomplish your desire, your goal. Yeah, I, I included settler cultures and traditions along with indigenous culture uh, cultures and traditions. Thank so, you, that makes it obvious, appreciate okay. that. Yeah. So you've added settler? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know we're all looking, We see if we had paper documents, we would be able to <laughs> see both of them. <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Moulter, if you, or uh, Ms. X, if you can put his motion up again just so that we can cross-reference it one more time. Okay, so you've added s settler cultures, so basically that. Correct, it's indigenous and settler culture and okay. traditions, and it's in respect of our ancestry in the area. That's... Okay, so maybe next time when you're doing that, maybe highlight what you're changing on there so that we know since it's so similar. Okay, so I'm not seeing any additional uh, questions on that, so you can close. You're, you're good? Nothing on close. Nothing on close, okay. Please cast your vote. It's closed. On this amendment. Okay, that's carried unanimously. Councillor Kelly, you said you had an amendment to it? I do, thank you, Mayor Catcher. I would move that section 4.3.2 of the city naming council policy be removed in its entirety. And speaking in favor of that motion, that section only suggests that perhaps when the time's right, that seniority be given precedence over other, other virtues in the in naming register registry. I don't see the need for it. I uh, flat out don't see the need for it. And it kind of gets back, Mayor Katcher, to your, your concerns expressed earlier about dealing with names that, that, that tend to hang around and maybe don't have relevance anymore. Um, this, this, this particular section gives relevance, even though it's obliquely and it's not strong, potentially gives relevance 
to to suggestions on the registry that that are there only because they haven't been removed. I think the council of the day is in a position and can always ask when was that particular name added to the registry, um, and you can you can make it the council of the day can make its make its best decision given the information it has in hand. It doesn't need to be reminded that that seniority plays any role whatsoever, and I don't think it ought to. So I, I that's that's my position, and I welcome other comments. Okay. Thank you. So they've put a motion on the council amend city naming policy by removing section 4.3.2 in its entirety. Okay. Uh, anything on discussion and debate? Not seeing any. Uh, would you, do you wish to close? Think further. Thank you. Okay. The motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. Okay, and that's carried unanimously. All right. Okay, so those are the two amending motions. So now we're back to the main motion, which was put on by Councillor Harris. Is there any other amendments? If not, I'm going to go to Councillor Harris to close. Not seeing any. Any closing comments, Councillor Harris? So it'll be just as amended. So that motion is now closed, and that's the first one for the policy. Please cast your vote. Okay, and that's carried. So question for you, Ms. Moulter. Do any of those pass on into the procedure or to Mr. Kaiser? Because I know the policy and sometimes they're, they're similar and I can't go back and check them really quickly. But I will um, take Councillor Harris to put the motion on for the uh, procedure. So just make sure that it's clean. In that light, I would move that Council adopt the revised city naming procedure Gov-002-C. Okay, thank you. Do you wish to speak to it? Um, no, procedures are required to support policies, and this one seems fairly straightforward, net of any amendments <laughs> that we've made that make sense. Okay, thank you. So to my question, without having to go look at it, there's no duplication of those? To your worship, no. The provisions that were amended uh, don't affect the content okay. of the procedure. Okay, all right. Anything on discussion and debate? Not seeing any. Anything on close? You're good. Okay. Please cast your vote. Okay, and that is carried unanimously. Thank you. And we have dealt with 7.3 and 7.4 under consent, so we are good with those. Are there any uh, notice of motions? Not seeing any. Are there any points of interest? Do you have a point of interest? Go. Interest. A point of interest, something on a board or committee that you represent that you may want to provide information to the general public or to the rest of council? No, it'll be in the next one, thanks. Sorry. Okay, councillor inquiries to administration. And these are inquiries to administration. No, I was just going to say that the uh, city roads crew did a good job in the snow removal, and we are head and shoulders above the city of Edmonton. So keep up the good work, roads crew. Go, team, go. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that brings us to the closed portion. So I will take a motion. Oh, you had a point of interest? Oh, I'll, I'll just make a motion to oh, go in camera. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I've turned him off before. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll move that council enter closed session for matters under FOIP. Thank you. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously, so we'll recess for five minutes while we transition up to the committee room. Thank you.